introduce our wonderful panelists. I just want to go over a few logistics for today. So all attendees have automatically have uh, been muted and their videos turned off. That being said, please use the Q&A feature on the chat, which is found on the bottom of your screen, um, to ask questions to our panelists at any point during the talk. We do have time allocated at the end for a Q&A round. And so if you have questions about the specifics of the showcase, we ask that you save these and instead email them to the organizers. So information about the email and website uh, with a link to the suggestion box will be in the chat. We also want to encourage everyone to visit our showcase webpage. Again, a link will be in the chat. So on this page, you'll be able to see all the updates about the event as they come up. Uh, we will be creating a dedicated Discord community so that we can encourage you to talk to each other and connect directly with us. And we'll be posting dates for the showcase um, in this link as well. We have a virtual suggestion box, as I mentioned, so you can submit feedback, questions, or recommendations. And also on this web page, we will share a non comprehensive list of racial equity board game design resources to use for you to support your research. Please feel free to suggest additions to the list again using the virtual suggestion box. So with that, I'm going to ask the panelists to turn on their cameras and I'm just going to read a brief bio for each of them um, and then we'll turn it over them to to provide more context. So I'm really pleased to have Drs. Kishana Gray, Ainu Kadir, and Lai Chi Fan with us today. Dr. Kishona Gray is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication and Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Illinois Chicago. She is an interdisciplinary, intersectional, digital media scholar whose areas of research include identity, performance, and online environments, embodied deviance, cultural production, video games, and black cyber feminism. Dr. Gray is the author of Intersectional Tech, Black Users in Digital Gaming. She is also the author of Race, Gender, and Deviance in Xbox Live, and the co-editor of two volumes on culture and gaming, Feminism in Play and Woke Gaming. Dr. Gray has published in a variety of outlets across disciplines and has also featured in public outlets such as The Guardian, The Telegraph, and The New York Times. You can follow Dr. Gray on Twitter at Kishona Gray. Dr. Ainu Kadir earned her PhD in 2018 from Making Culture Lab School of Interactive Arts and Technology at Simon Fraser University. Dr. Ainu Kadir's research focuses on practices and theories of design and the study of interactive multimedia in the humanities, ethnographic practice, and museum curation. She works with local communities in Northwest China, in the Pacific Northwest, and in the Six Nation territories to develop digital media that document, manage, safeguard, and represent indigenous cultural heritage. She is exploring how different new media, such as interactive documentaries, virtual museums, digital archive databases, interactive museum guides, video games, and artificial intelligence systems can be designed using collaborative participatory methodologies in order to preserve and revitalize cultural heritage and heal collective trauma. She's currently the principal investigator for Robert Harding and Lois Claxton Humanities and Social Sciences Endowment Awarded Project, Alternative Narratives, Dialogue with the History of Waterloo County Murals in collaboration with the Ken Sealing Waterloo Region Museum. And finally, we have Dr. Lai Chi Fan, who is an assistant professor of English at the University of Waterloo and a faculty researcher of the Critical Media Lab and Games Institute. She researches digital storytelling, media theory and infrastructure, research creation, or critical making and gender tech AI and labor. She makes digital and material art about e-waste, feminized crafts, emojis and fashion. Fan is an editor and the director of communications of the Electronic Book Review and co-editor of the Digital Review. 
She is co-editor of the 2020 collection Post-Digital Dialogues and Debates from Electronic Book Review from Bloomsbury and is the editor of forthcoming journal issues on Canadian digital poetics and critical making critical design. Dr. Fan is the formal lead of narrative design for the Breathing Games Commons, an international collective that works with medical practitioners to design and develop video games for children with respiratory illness. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our fabulous panel. And I'm just gonna read out the first question um, to any, any one of the panelists who wants to, to take it. Um, what should be the expectations for any game submission? Are there any specific components that the game must include? I can start. First off, I'm so glad to be a part of this. I think, you know, when so many people are thinking about, you know, being inclusive of like, you know, diverse perspectives and making sure that, you know, their work, you know, is like culturally responsive and that it's like anti-racist, you know, these are big lofty goals, right? You know, I want to make sure that, you know, folks know that this is not easy work. It's not something simple to do. And, it, and it's not like a prescriptive kind of like template where you do like one, two, and three, and voila, you've got it, you know? It, it takes work and it takes time and it's trial and error. You're going to make mistakes. And I think one of the things that I, I guess I wish people would um, can, can do is just uh, be reflective and be open to like critique and feedback and and to just say, okay, yeah, I did mess that up, but I want to do better next time. I want to, you know, make the modifications and do the changes. You know, I want, I just want people to know that it's not like a one-time thing. You know, this is something that you have to be continually like invested in, you know, to making sure that, you know, you get it right because there will be missteps. Um, and I think, you know, folks just need to be open to be able to just like receive that information and to listen and learn and just to do better next time. I'll just briefly echo Kishana in that uh, aspects of design are always um, uh, build and figure out what didn't work and then go back and go back. And, and so it's a, it's a very much a, a process of thinking about what is and is not working, including, including um, a process that that must, must uh, ask the designers to in, in, to undergo a kind of self awareness of and um, ideally I think that uh, games that get submitted to the showcase should include some kind of self aware rationale or rationale in general a rationale of objectives uh, the intended audience the intended contribution to issues in racial equity and anti racism. Yeah, I I wholeheartedly support both of you. Uh, the process, the iterative process, and the self ref reflection really gives you a guideline of like you know what is your end goal in this game. Uh, yes, it's not like one, two, three step. How you use this game create a meaningful discussion. Um, gameplay creates a uh, safe space to create meaningful discussions. So um, if the quality of components uh, that you created serve the larger theme or the issue that you want to address, if the game mechanism reflects um, this conversation. So um, also the easy to pick up kind of like accessible game is very important. Uh, there are some avid gamers who like a very complicated strategic games and there are uh, some other folks might you know like use a simple card game and then um, have the deep discussions that leave them a very good lessons so um, think about all those like a uh, different perspective and especially like whom are you designing for this game are are they primarily the kids or the adults or the, it's like uh, professional gamers it's like uh, then you can aim um, specific strategy toward uh, that community that you want to um, facilitate the dialogue I want to add some more if that's okay 
Um, and I don't want to be long winded, please. I know we don't have like a moderator. Please don't just don't let me talk too much. Um, I also think, you know, I found that the most successful kinds of uh, games and gaming experiences, you know, either from board games or, you know, digital games or whatever, you know, whatever have you, they, the ones that have like that feedback loop open, you know, to receive the information, like in some way, like make sure that that's clear, that people can comment and like leave feedback. Because I know sometimes we get sensitive about the things that we create. You know, I understand that. And we, we don't want it to be critiqued, you know, but I think that it's important to do that work and to do that reflexive, you know, um, um, engagements, like to say, hey, uh, there, you know, I, I'm, I need to be ready to like listen to what, you know, the community, you know, has to say. Um, and I also think, you know, just in those, um, you know, going, you know, back to the question, you know, thinking about what people like can do. I think we also have to make sure that we're intentional enough to make sure that we've um, brought everybody and everything to the table, you know, to make sure, you know, I'm often talking about, you know, what's at the table, who's at the table, who's making these decisions. Um, and if, if you find that there are some populations of people that are an afterthought that you, you need to like rethink, like, did I really incorporate them meaningfully into like the, you know, the, the design iterations and ideation phases? Um, so for instance, if you're going to make like another, even, even if you're going to make like another civilization game, like, have you, consumed all of the content about like all of the the missteps and people critiquing and you know people talking about you know it being rooted in like you know colonial settler logic and you know have you like addressed you know even the the, the, sh the shortcomings already of you know some of like the main themes of your game and i really think that it's just like that that you know very important that you before you do it just start to think okay what might it look like on the other end you know when i'm done how might different populations of people and do that exercise of like okay if i'm a trans person how might they receive you know the these games and these narratives. If I'm an, uh, an indigenous person, how might they receive, you know, these these messages and narratives? If I'm black, how might they receive those kinds of things? And I think you, you really have to just do that that exercise, you know, while you're creating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And also uh, in that exercise, sometimes it's okay if you cannot really um, able to reflect how uh, an indigenous person or Muslim person might uh, receive that game. Just uh, be open about it and ask and invite your friends or friends or friends. Like it's great that we have this um, group chat and Discord, so uh, you can collaborate with others and invite more diverse uh, folks and uh, do iterative process of like you know how uh, different folks with different cultural background or experience uh, could offer or critique your idea or like, you know, collaborate and help your idea to get better. Do we just go on to the next thing? Can we just talk about a, another kind of thing? I wasn't sure if like we would receive the questions or if we can just like, um, uh, is, is it possible for us to um, like talk about like briefly, like where where we're situated within like the gaming space? I think that's really important, you know, for people mm -hmm. to like know our, our relationship to games and our, our experiences, you know, with these kinds of things. Is, is that possible on here? You want to? Yeah, I think start? so. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to start? Take the uh, take the lead to Sean on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think most people, you know, when you when you um, somebody might be saying she don't know nothing about board games. What is she doing talking here? Right. And I think and that's a fair point. Right. But I think that, you know, uh, all of us here, regardless of our connection to like, you know, board games or, or co co connections to like digital games, you know, we have something to offer because of our positionality and our experiences like within the world. Right. You know, because especially, you know, the things that we can contribute to design and, you know, to helping people like, you know, make sense of these kinds of things because you know design has like a universal like qualities right and we want to make sure that those qualities are intersectional and, and and accessible also you know from jump you know so um you know most of you all know you know like the, the work that i do you know i focus specifically about you know the experiences of like black and indigenous populations and um latinx populations within the gaming space and i'm focused more so like on the communities and the community that's built around you know the things that we interact with the things that we may call games or the things that we may consider play but i'm 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 more you know I, I'm um, focus like on the the experiences that um, people have with one another um, whenever they're brought to the table to play, right? So like the population of people around different kinds of board games, you know, what does that look like? And also like, you know, a traditional like play, like, you know, 
like for for instance, you know, I I learned um, that that lacrosse, you know, has like an, an indigenous roots, and you know, I, I I didn't know that, and you know, think about you know, lacrosse is like rooted in like Ivy leagues, and I see these privileged, you know, white men, you know, playing this game that you know has traditions, you know, in indigenous culture. So, um, um, and and also like uh, double j- dutch and jump rope, you know, has amazing you know connections to like you know like the black community, um, and so I I'm just really you know fascinated just to see how people engage, you know, how communities and cultures have engaged like in play like over time and how that stems from, you know, from our ancestral roots and everything. So I think that's just really significant. So that that's my contribution. So I'll, I'll let it go right there. Laichi, do you want to talk about it? Sure. Um, so a lot of my comments, I'm coming, I'm speaking, I'm, while I do play probably more board games than, uh, than video games, uh, a lot of my discussion and comments will not just apply to the design of anti-racist board games, but as I'm coming in as a as a digital scholar and also as or and, and as a media scholar, but also as um, somebody who's worked on on digital video games, my conversation, my um, perspective in this case is on anti-racist design in general and questions of design in general, design for consumers, design for users designed for players and um, overall my intent is to uh, increase user awareness on critical issues and the difference actually for me is quite obvious when we're talking about board games versus video games in that going um, going analog really removes the potential for um, built in this is a this is a actually a an academic term but built in procedural rhetoric which is uh, one way to describe it would be the built-in biases and, and, and of of uh, game per- parameters. So in the in the in Skyrim, I believe that in characters are choosing their avatars walk. There's there are two choices. You can either walk like this, or you can kind of sway your hips. It's either masculine or feminine. And a lot of my work in critical code studies analyzes the uh it, it's it's actually quite like a binary structure that is being reinforced and also cultural stereotypes and expectations that are being reinforced through this kind of procedural rhetoric and going analog removes those sort of pre um those ex- those existing conditions that are controlled by industry level designers so there's agency in board games and what we can might be able to consider a sort of grassroots approach to design eliminating the sort of um, top-down model, uh, the, the top-down infrastructure of, of questions of design and allowing the everyday users to, to tell their own stories, to design their own games and, and to um, create their own, own platforms. It's sort of in the tradition of what's often called creative misuse as well. So anyway, that's, I, I know, would you like to go? Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, I came from interactive arts and technology and especially more focused on media anthropology and museum study. My interest and research um, lies on very strong methodological aspect, especially the collaborative and indigenous research methodology. So uh, especially in the knowledge creation or sharing um, information, how do we design collaboratively uh, outside of this traditional, like uh, designer-based uh, sort of work mechanism? For example, working together with indigenous community and uh, not coming as in like uh, someone who have like you know doctoral degree, but just be part of the community and what we can learn through making. So I'm very interested in the process of making and process of collaboration, how the community uh, participate to this like design process and offer very uh, interesting and meaningful insights. For example, uh, in BC uh, with uh, Japanese Canadian communities, we designed um, this educational resources for primary school, grade three and grade four students about the Japanese internment history. So it is a heavy topic and, uh, you know, the kids 
it's really hard to uh, deliver the essence of the information. So educators and elders and other uh, youth participants, we worked on this kind of like a gamified um, teaching resources that using the um, existing historical properties of a land or you know factories or house students randomly have their property cards and then they draw a really beautiful home or their shop and everything and a different human uh, we ask them like use different paper for each layer human or property or uh, their backyard or, or, or every anything everything and then when they we didn't tell anything at the beginning when they finish all the drawing we confiscate all their property and we pick their avatars and place into the internment camp and then they suddenly uh, like uh, realize that this is wrong this is not fair like i've been working so hard to create this this wealth of media, how could you just like come in, take it away? And then we explain uh, the fairness and then other historical implication of this uh, historical event. So it's not specifically like a game per se that you win or gain points, but gamified approach that really teach um, this heavy issues to, you know, like to students to, to understand uh the dimensions so this kind of approach of like uh working together with indigenous community or other marginalized community to teach certain aspect of the history or cultural heritage with gamified approach uh is very much in my uh interest of research i think that's fantastic i also you you had me also thinking about um like how I use like a lot of like card games, for instance, like in the classroom. So, you know, I often bring in Black Card Revoked and La, Lote La Loteria. Um, I and I found that, you know, I brought them in and um, students were like fascinated. So, you know, they had like the in assignment where they, you know, like did a similar thing. But I had a student, um, she's a Mexican-American woman, you know, whenever I taught like at, at ASU when I was in the Southwest. And, you know, she had um, never really heard, she never played it. She had heard of it because, you know, older generations in her family will, will play La Loteria. Um, but she said it was like, it was, they were so disconnected from that, right? So what she did, it was a beautiful thing. She recreated it and essentially up dated it and upgraded it so that the examples and for those of you who may not know like La, La Loteria um, it has like different like um, images and pictures it's kind of like a bingo game you know with like different aspects of like you know Mexican and, and indigenous culture like you know on the on the cards um, and so what she did you know she was like you know me and my cousins you know we we, we, did, we don't talk like this you know we don't engage like this we don't so she updated it to make more sense of like what they were doing and included like social media and that was a way of like you know her and like her her family you know like engaging like across like generationally, you know, so some of the, the elders, you know, were playing with like the kids in ways that they never had before, you know, when they, they incorporated, you know, some of the traditional aspects and also the, the, the things that she had upgraded, I thought was like really powerful and beautiful. And then something else, you know, I wanted to, to mention, especially like with Black Card Revoked, I had some students that, that were playing it. And, and at first when they were playing it, because Black Card Revoked is very, very, very much like a, a game rooted in like Black mainstream popular culture, right? You have to really have grown up in the culture to get to really win, you know, so, you know, it's one of the times where like black knowledge, you know, and black epistemology is like privileged and, and recognized in this space, which is very cool. Um, and then, you know, I had a student who had at first, you know, expressed like frustration and thought that they're that they were at a disadvantage because, you know, they said there's no way for me to be able to win a white student, you know, and he said, you know, there's no way for me to like really win at this game. And he said, you know, I was sitting with that uncomfort at, for a moment, but then I realized, you know, this game doesn't have to be about me and that's okay. I can still engage and I, I just use it as like a learning process as like learning experience. You know, I can just learn and I'm like, Oh, okay. What, what, what does that mean? You know what, you know, so he sat and he learned a lot of, you know, about, about black culture from the other, you know, from the black folks that were, you know, in the space um, with him. And I think it's, that's also like very important as we're designing these things. You have to think about who's your audience, who are you doing this for? You know, as you're, are you just like exposing, you know, traditional mainstream, you know, white audiences, you know, to, 
some of our hidden cultures or some of our subcultures, right? And, you know, that's cool. But sometimes we can be intentional and just design specifically and create it for us, by us. And that's okay, too. You know, I realized, you know, as I was playing like, like La Loteria, you know, I didn't complain that I didn't know, you know, what Platanos was or, you know, a lot of these things, you know, from, you know, from, um, you know, Latino, Hispanic, um, indigenous culture, you know, I was like, well, this is something that I can learn, you know, and I wanted to just learn and just sit and I didn't take up space either. You know, I didn't want to say, explain this to me. Now, what does that mean? Now, what, what's an abuela? Yeah, I, di I didn't do that thing that, you know, we might, you know, have, have wanted to do, you know, I just spent that time recognizing that, you know, this is a space, you know, for other folks and I want to support that space and, 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 and affirm them, you know, in that space, like around the game. And I just, I just really think it's just really beautiful how those, how different cultures were able to come together, you know, um, uh, around those games. Can I just jump in because uh, one of the questions that came in is a really good um, link to what you were talking about around design. So the question is, are there examples of designs where this process has been successfully implemented with a positive outcome? And so if you could speak to this both from the board game and video game uh, realms. Um, then I would just sort of add on to what Kishan is saying about, uh, in particular, black card revoked and the students experience of feeling like, well, I, there's no way for me to win. Sometimes the point is to lose. Uh, there's no need to, <laughs> there's no need for that person to exactly uh, strategize and then win the game. That's not the point in this case. It's in, it's the point is to understand that they don't, uh, they may not understand. And what does that educate what does that uh, give them in terms of um critical thinking and and, and self-reflection i also think about um for for ex examples of design that um it, this is related to another question that was asked of us uh what we should pay attention to in terms of example exemplary games um so cards against humanity is not a politically correct game but in there are ways for instance to also hack existing games to make them a little bit more friendly including creating your own cards in it in, in um, cards against humanity and throwing away cards that are just wrong and we don't that we don't want to perpetuate so getting rid of those um what else was i thinking of this is so in addition to board games the we were also asked about digital experiences or digital games. And here I was thinking about the really great um, Aboriginal Territories Cyberspace Network at Concordia University in Montreal, which is led by Jason Edward Lewis and Scott Winati, who are two Indigenous artists and scholars. So they, in, in addition to their research, they fund the Skins video game workshops, which teach indiz Indigenous youths to design games based on their own cultures and languages and heritages. And I have links prepared. So um, the, here are some of the released objects. I think that the creative output, the educational and pedagogical structure of what they're doing is a, an example of, for me at least, an, an example of a successful initiative towards um, racial equity or it doesn't even always have to be about anti-racism. This is also a question I was thinking about. Like when uh, the, our our campus in Waterloo, in, for instance, has there have been a lot of discussions about um, anti-racism, anti-black racism. But in addition to anti-black racism, which is its one its own conversation, blackness is its own conversation. Those two are not the same things. In the same way that talking about like with COVID nineteen um, as xenophobic conversations are not the same as talking about Chinese culture. One is the the rejection of uh, xenophobia, and the other one is a celebration. So the, there are very different attitudes going on. And I think that um, when I'm using the example of the um, Skins Workshop, those Skins Workshops at Concordia, I'm describing this as a celebration, which is different. And, and uh, we could potentially call, uh, describe that in terms of racial equity, but not necessarily anti-racism. So the, the language here is very, very important, for, uh, in my opinion. Kachana, you might have like tons of examples. <laughs> I did, I do, but I didn't. I also want to make sure that I make space, and I didn't. I, if you wanted to to go ahead and, and, and you, you, go, you go ahead. <laughs> I think that's such a, you know, like she, what you just said, I think that that's so, so powerful, impactful. And I think we often have these discussions, you know, and, and I, 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 I use the phrase, you know, and well, it's not my phrase, but, you know, when talking about like Afro pessimism and how we're often like rooted in talking about, you know, like the oppression and the inequalities and talking about like the resistance, but, you know, forgetting that we also have tons of joy 
and happiness. And, you know, we aren't just rooted in those kinds of things. And I think that's like the mo one of the powerful things like around with um, like Black Heart Revoke. So, for instance, think about like in, in this class, we started the game with Monopoly. We started the class like, you know, like with Monopoly. Right. And, you know, most people don't have fun with Monopoly. Right. You really have to be like a, you know, like a property real estate mogul, a baron and an oppressive person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. <laughs> what life better is the one percent. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love getting to that that point. But, you know, people leave Monopoly so frustrated, even even the game of life, you know, that, you know, people leave those games like so frustrated. You know, they got all these kids and all their money's going out with taxes and stuff, you know, so I think it's I think it's really just like hilarious that um that, you know, like a game like Black Card Revoked, it allows you to just be and exist in like joy and happiness and and thinking that, you know, those small, like subcultural, minute details of your culture, you know, like other like we can share like in it, like collectively. And I think that's important too, you know, when people want to want to do design, you know, I feel like so many like gamers and I see this too often, especially like in, in the video game world and the, the design world where they want to provide this authentic experience. And in their mind, the authentic experience has to highlight, you know, the the, the pessimism, you know, has, has to highlight the structure, you know, the, the structural inequalities and, um, and, 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 you, and, and that's not necessary, right? You know, so people, when you're designing these kinds of things, you know, you have to think, you know, am I, am I, I want to be rooted in anti racism that's cool you know like like she said that's one thing but you want to talk about blackness that's totally different you know you have to make sure that you you are uh having the the appropriate conversations and doing the the, the due diligence and the background work to make sure to 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 to, to really confront wh what you're trying to do and acknowledge like your limitations because not everybody mm -hmm. can do it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i totally agree i think many people also um are so afraid to be politically correct or very afraid of like, you know, uh, deconstructing this idea of like blackness or indigeneity uh, to really understand the concurrent examples. So many times I um, advise my students to uh, learn specific stories, read some autobiography or like, you know, talk to your friend and and think about like, you know, if I had that identity, how would you respond? Like if you were a uh, Japanese Canadian in 1930 and has to be removed with like one small suitcase to the camp, like how would you react, right? So I think uh, there are many good examples. Uh, you might all know the inequality Apply, right? Inspired by Monopoly, that everyone has an identity at the very beginning. And uh, this identity of like, uh, you know, like having different ethnic background will give you a very different starting point. Um, and another good example can be uh, the board game called Refugee Journey. And it's a simple board game that designed to help uh, especially the front frontline workers to help uh, the refugees. So even about the refugees, uh, Canadians have lots of like misconceptions, you know. Um, so it's how um, how you help them without, you know, showing that you are this big generous uh, entity that expecting appreciation or something like that, you know, like. They come with very complex uh, history, identity, frustration. So, um, you know, through this process, how their identity became a factor in their integration in the, in, in the Canadian society. So it's not like one way pass of like, oh, you came to Canada, voila, all your problems solved. It's like a two way of understanding, right? Um, and it, it's very interesting in that game, like any point when you're playing the game, if you are Muslim, you, you get the Muslim card, you have to move back at least to space. So this kind of like a concurrent examples uh, really make the player think about what it means, right? And also some other examples, um, the niched up games, I, designed by a brilliant indigenous um, game designer and to me the fascinating part is in um, it, it started as you sort of like a role playing as a young indigenous person moved from reserve to city and you have very different 
uh, choices to make uh, to integrate into society or like about your education or, you know, like all the policy. Um, and then the journey to get this um, elder or adulthood. So what's really exciting about this game, game at each stage, instead of the game, uh, game like scores, you gain, you gain a resistance point. So like how strong you are in a different settings, like based on your choice, you, you will get uh, more point to show your strengths and show your um, uh, resilience. So this kind of like games that bring uh, specific personal stories and frustrations and feelings to the table, I think could um, open up a genuine discussion and a good uh, setting to understand instead of be talking about like a big rhetorics and discourse and it, it, it's complicated theory that we deal with and uh, for many people it's hard to grasp so so um dealing with some very personal stories personal experience and bring this to the gameplay even just like you know simply sharing that and uh uh, use players' empathy and the compassion to raise this issue, I think will be a good example for, for uh, games. So I think you've all touched on um, really the complexities and nuances in designing these things with, you know, really carefully. And so another question that came in is, what is your advice on portraying cultures visually without stereotyping, but still educating? That's a, that's a fantastic question because I know that's that's rooted in you know people just um, not wanting to mess up right and um, but if we we've learned so much really from like you know from video games right you know constantly you know whenever we have you know you know uh, folks from like the global south featured right they're featured in like the most stereotypical ways you know I'm thinking about. Uh, doll sim uh you know the the indian character on street fighter or uh blanca the brazilian character you know or um any any black character or indigenous characters i'm thinking about you know whenever they feature feature um indigenous characters from like um and uh, north america you know they're always featured in you know very um uh you know i'll say stereotypical ways but you know but i also wanted to i think it's it's important also to note that what people might see as like stereotypical stereotypical like features are still real aspects in a lot of our cultures, right? You know, there is certain parts of like wardrobe that chiefs will wear during like rituals and ceremonies. There are drug dealers in the black community. You know, there are, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's important that, that people recognize that if that's the only story that's being told, then that's when it becomes like the problem, right? Like if you don't have other images, you know, to, um, I don't want to say to combat the stereotypes, but just to offset, you know, those stereotypical images. Like, because really, like, that's all we see. All we see is like the black drug dealer. All we see is like the, you know, the brown help. All we see is like the Middle Eastern terrorist. You know, that those are the, all the things. You or all we see is like the Indian chief. You know, that they, they're not giving us like any anything else. You know, so that's that's where the problem comes in. That so I would say for those people who are wanting to portray like cultures in the, these visual ways, like, is this the where did you get your information from? Right. I think that's very important. Like, is it just like what you have like you know picked from your own brain oh i remember seeing you know like you know the navajo nation was you know featured in this way and black people were like that and so you have to think like is this just what you have like kind of curated in your own brain you know from years of you being you know con consuming um mass media images and you consuming stereotypical imagery or was it from your own research and did, did you go to the archives and did you talk to the uh, to the elders of the communities and did you talk to like that the the historian of black culture you know at the, your local university you know did you do like your work to to really come up with like a better way to like visually like portray you know your um your the, the populations that that's in your game and then you know you also have to say that if you feel like you're just be, you're reducing folks to like stereotypes then maybe you aren't equipped to to handle you know those narratives in that way everybody like i said earlier everybody can't do it 
everybody shouldn't be doing it, you know, and if you're not going to add anything to the story, that's another thing. Like, is your story and are these narratives adding something uh, or are you just going to replicate the same old things that we constantly get? And if I, if you're doing that, then I say full stop, you don't even need it. So I would say add something to, to the narrative and add something to the conversation. Don't just replicate what's there. And I think that's also like the challenge. I'm going to shut up now. You know, so I know you all want to talk, talk too, but I think that's the problem, especially when it, when it comes to like these larger companies and these larger entities, they want to give us what has sold historically, which is why we constantly get like, you know, settler colonial narratives of like taking over lands, you know, in so many of these like civilization games, right? You know, that's like just like the, the common trope and the common theme that people are like, okay, well, this is our premise. Now we build off of that. Well, why does that have to be the premise? Who said that that was the premise? And I think that's where you have to like do that that extra that 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 work, you know, and challenging and de debunking, you know, what what people have said, you know, is like the 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 jumping off point from like a lot of a lot a lot of these games. I don't mind listening to Kishana keep talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to take up all the time. No, please don't. I, are are well, there no, more I, questions? I, I go ahead. Same way as what you were saying. Am I adding anything? If not, I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that question. That that really is like like an important question, though. Are there other questions? Are we okay to engage? I guess I'll just leave that that up to our. I I, I just want to add a, a small point. Um, a very good question about stereotyping, and there are tons of games that can be a really good bad example. You know, like they are like so bad that like um just. Other day, I was in the game store and then I saw this like uh, train robbery game that uh, there are three main character, one black, one indigenous, one Asian. <laughs> the black is a gunman, indigenous is a theft and the Asian is a spy. So it just hits on the, my face right there. I'm like, is this is 2020? How could you? Right. So uh, just do your homework, do your research, and at least um, even, just maybe try to break the stereotype. You know, like when I tell people that I am Muslim and from China, people get really confused. Like, oh, you're from China and Muslim? How does that work? I'm like, yeah, there are 40 million of Muslim community in China, so you can read more. This kind of things, you know, like just do more research. What's out there? What could you bring or enlarge uh, in terms of your own perspective and uh, players' perspective, right? Wow, you folks are just leading into these questions so well. Um, so the next one is around. Um, is there some kind of approval scale or system that exists for rating racial equity, queer friendliness um, of new games? And if not, would something like that be useful and what could that entail? And I mean, one thing that strikes me is what you said, are you adding to the narrative? Like drop the mic, that was such a powerful statement. But yes, wondering, um, you know, what other, what other things would be useful in terms of um, a scale or system? Lachie, were you going to say something? I didn't want to just. Not necessarily. I was just thinking about in, ter in terms of. Um, I, there's no, there's no like back test for <laughs> racial equity. Not one, at least that I would, that I know maybe this is maybe, you know what? Maybe that's what you could contribute to the showcase. Maybe we need a best practices, something like that. However, I would state um, just as part of that question about does some sort of approval scales exist for racial equity queer friendliness those two things should not be lumped together in, in that uh, so racial equity would have its own sort of best practices i'm, I'm sure that that's not what the uh the uh at the question for asker is, is is suggesting but um if if like queer queer uh what was it queer representation queer queer friendliness should have its own scale in the same way that the re uh, representation of women having conversations that have nothing to do with men has its own scale. So these are separate conversations. But as far as I know, I can't think of any. Um, do either of you? Yeah. Better resources? Yeah, I know. I got opinions. Um, so <laughs> 
a couple things. First, I do want to shout out um, that there is like a, um, I don't know if it's like a scale, but the CIPT, Can I Play That? Um, it's it's hosted by Courtney Craven, who is doing like really amazing work at around like um, uh, disability narratives and um, uh, accessibility and accommodation. So, you know, what, what this site does is like, hey, you have a video game. How how disabled friendly is it? Like, can you know people who have like different levels of vision or hearing, um, you know, can or different, you know, um, you know, can can they play it? So I think that that's like a really useful like place to start and think about you know how accessible uh, a game might be, right? And I think that that gives us like a maybe a jumping off point to see like what some of the uh, other like Beckdale, you know, kind of like skill like might might look like. But I also I guess I just want to also caution. You know, because uh, I'm not one that likes to reduce like cultures to like a measure of like, okay, I did I, like a checklist, you know, like, okay, I did these th three things. And so now, you know, it's, it's queer friendly, you know, so, you know, they, they exist in the scene together and, you know, they had, you know, like non stereotypical kisses and love me. I mean, I don't know, like, like, cause really we would have to be like reducing cultures to just like items that can be like, you know, picked up and thrown in, you know? So I think, you know, we have to, I think it could be done in like a really meaningful way. Um, but I really think you, you know, we have to think about, you know, how we might like define, like, how will we define like racial, racial equity? You know, is it, you know, like the number of like, you know, like black and indigenous people that we might see on screen at a certain time or how many lines that they have, you know, are they talking to each other in like culturally, you know, you know, sensitive and competent kind of ways, or, you know, are they able to talk without like, you know, white, a white person present or having to like explain their culture to like white people? I mean, there are all kinds of ways that we can even, you know, think about, you know, how this might, might, might exist. And I, and I guess that that would also be like an easy, way I feel like this I don't want to say that this might be like the cop out you know to not doing like the meaningful work because you know if we came up with like the checklist then you know if somebody like reached that checklist and we approve the checklist and then they might not do that other more meaningful kind of work that needs to like exist like behind the game right and then people would say well we don't have to hire you know those folks to to, to have to you know consult us and bring to the table because we did it already this exists you know so I, I guess I, I go back and forth you know I would it would be useful to have that as like a guide or a reference you know but I still want to make sure that people also do do like that other do the the work that they need to do as well because I, I still feel like you know people are wanting to make this like an easy simple thing and it's not easy and simple if i could just add to that i realize that the, the, these this conversation and these questions are uh and the, the existing one about visual representation these conversations about representation are about the final product but actually the racial equity begins from the beginning and in and, and, and questions and in questions of design. So Kushana gave the example of not needing to hire others. If there are experts and experts in a sort of culture or a heritage that you are that you are looking into, absolutely hire them, give them money. Um, but uh, the reason I mentioned this is because uh, the, the, the initiatives towards racial equity start from the beginning in, in avoiding stereotypes in and uh and and the performativity of the of others capital o others but also exploitation of workload and responsibilities and i'm i'm sure i'm not the only one who feels that uh when it comes to trying to work towards better representation what ends up happening is that the workload is unbalanced imbalanced because certain people are uh, assigned that work because they might do it better and that's possibly true especially if they're the, the better authority on on a specific topic but that doesn't mean they can't they have to do all the work because that's also a, an unfair kind of representation and, and and the worst part about it is it's invisible it doesn't even show up in the final game like uh, and a lot of my work is about on women's in, invisible labor in technology and and i think um I guess to to uh, see how that works in other spaces. Who's doing invisible labor is a big part of is a big question for me a lot of the time. And um, the design and marketing and 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 like dissemination processes are invisible. So those are uh, things to also take into consideration. Is representation happening the whole way? Yeah, um, I think my suggestions to the designers, the participants, um, instead of thinking like from the bigger picture to your design, like bird eye view, okay, my game has to be the racial equity game. Uh, is there any checkpoints that I addressed everything? Just uh, work from bottom up, 
right? Like, is there a specific issue or story that you really want to do and then build everything on top of that? Uh, media is a very powerful, um, powerful role in like, you know, educating people, for example, um, and uh, lots of times and sometimes it it's unexpected. So I was reading this uh, paper about uh, post genocide of Rwanda and how a soap opera really uh, create this, created this meaningful discussion and then bridge the divided community to talk about it. So that soap op opera didn't uh, intentionally um, start as, you know, like, oh, we have to bring this bridge and then we have to make people talk about it but it started as just soap opera and use those content and tell those stories and it then created such a space. So um, I think, you know, like as a designer, so think about like, what is the main um, story that you want to highlight? For example, like, you know, um, if I really want to tell the story of like a Muslim Chinese community who immigrated in Canada, or if I want to tackle the um, the the wage gap, like I was reading the news New York Times article that the wage gap between white and black workers in U.S. same same was 1950. We think we came a long way. But in 2020, we have like pretty much same wage gap between different those race. So if you let's say if you have those statistics, how would you use that to your game? So that's my suggestions. I'm also thinking about instead of a sort of guide on or a scale or a checklist, what about the reverse? And instead of looking for best practices, um, creating a you have failed list. And so using that as a barometer for people in the future, like, nope, you made this common mistake and this one and this one. And like the the sort of anti anti checklist. <laughs> that might be a good contribution. <laughs> Thank you for that. So the next one was um, that anti racist work often leads to uncomfortable, painful discussions that lead to personal growth. So for analog board game design, how do you allow these to happen while fostering safe spaces? Are there strategies to use and things to avoid? This is a, a fantastic question. And I think that it's important to recognize that those are um, the, um, the growth it's it's two different audiences, right? I'm always like, you know, who is the audience for this, right? Because the conversation that you may have with like, you know, black, indigenous, you know, Latinx, you know, Asian populations is totally different than the conversation you will have like with white populations, right? And those conversations, you know, could be different, you know, across like, you know, like um, um, men and women and, and, and trans populations and intersex populations like too, right? You have to think like, who is it that needs the growth? Who is it that needs um, like to who, who's uncomfortable? You know, I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, like j just this morning, you know, like the I'm, I was on a, a Good Morning America segment, you know, talking about like race and gaming and everybody's like so shocked, like, oh, my gosh, this racism's in the gaming space. Like all of us already know, like, of course, it's there. Like where y'all been is been there, you know, since like day one, you know, so but I'm thinking about, you know, think about like the uncomfortable and the discomfort, you know, like who is uncomfortable, right? You know, is it um, and we often found that, you know, it's mostly like, you know, some some of our our, our more progressive liberal white friends who don't often hear these kinds of things, you know, their spaces, you know, are, you know, they're working to do like the anti-racist, you know, kind of work. And, you know, they all, they don't often hear this stuff. So they are really like uh, affronted and confronted and assaulted by hearing, you know, just like this, this overt racism that is happening like on a daily basis like to folks right um and i think that you know it's it's important that you know those folks have to be like you know they're like oh my gosh you know we don't want this in the space how does this ha even happen you know that's that's not for me to like teach and educate them so think about how my growth gets done it having to get them up to speed on this moving train of like okay well let me take you back to day one the games went online or you know let me take you back here your games have always you know had this uh, you know settler colonial logic you know let me take you you know so we have to stop our growth to get people up to speed on the conversation you know and i think that that when we when we think about 
you know, we, when we incorporate these kinds of things, you know, those are just introductory conversations. So some people think that, hey, I completed the game. I did the work. Now it's all done. You know, that's just the starting point, you know, and then, then of course you got, you got your book clubs, you got to learn, you know, how to be less anti, how to be less racist, or, you know, you have to read like all the books and, and then you have to go and implement that. Like, so it's like a process. It's a journey. And I, I just see that, you know, like board games and video games, like these part, you know, these things can be, you know, activated and mobilized, you know, to help do like that that work as well you know for the for those of us of, of us who are invested and committed to doing like anti-racist work like in, in in video games like you know we have to like recognize that your game's not going to solve the problem so get it out of your mind that your game i'm going to solve anti-racism you know you won't be racist anymore no that's that's not what's going to happen you know so i think you really have to like modulate you know you like your expectations into just pick a snippet or a slice of something that you want to engage and try to do that very well you know recognizing that that it still has has its limits um so you know when you talk about you know how do how does it happen and while fostering safe spaces well sometimes the spaces won't always be safe right sometimes they're, they're going to be uncomfortable and we have to have those tough conversations but you don't always have to have people who look like me and, uh, and us in the space. We don't have to be a part of that. Sometimes white folks can just talk to white folks, right? Sometimes it could just be that, you know, and, and I, but I think that um, uh, like the things to avoid is don't be trying to have like, you know, dialogue where you're bringing everybody to a, a, the table to have a conversation through your game, right? Because that's just, that's just, that's unfair for everybody because, you know, some, White folks, you know, aren't ready to be confronted with some of the things that I might have to say, and I'm not going to be ready to go back to the starting line to walk you along the way either. You know, so you have to think about where does where is my conversation happening? Like at one point, because like, remember, it's a moving train. Always think of that when you contribute to a conversation, you're jumping on board a moving train that has been moving for decades and centuries and has a long history and legacy, you know, to to, to indigenous and the ancestral um, roots. And so you have to think about, OK, are you just jumping on right now? OK, well, then you have a lot of work. You got you got some catch up to do. I'm shutting up. I, yeah. I think, I, oh, sorry. Go. I know. Go ahead. No. Yeah, yeah. You go ahead. No. 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 You were first. <laughs> okay. I think this is a fantastic question. Um, so things to avoid. There. Are, I think. Um, I'm, I'm starting with example. Like for example, the refugee journey board game that I mentioned earlier. It is a great tool that really helps the existing residents of Canada uh, volunteer at Newcomer Centre to understand like how it feel like, you know, like. And it's beauty of the game that you are uh, sort of like a playing um, different different character in very different settings. So, OK, so you have this identity card and you are a Muslim, you just immigrated from this country and how would you like uh, do this? So, it gives the space to think from uh, the refugee perspective. And sometime, you know, it would be very hard and you might still do um, make decisions based on what you have been doing for years, right? But it at least like make people think about it. So there, there can be um, sort of like a after a game uh, talk about bullet points, you know, like your your games that can contain this kind of like uh, component that, you know, after you finish the game, you can talk about this is this, this point or at the end, like in the middle, um, maybe give some explanations, right? Like uh not board game for, but for the video game for example the never alone every time uh when the player have um uh kind of like a uh, frustrated situation uh you can choose uh, a real video from an elder giving you advice right so you can integrate this kind of advice to your board game um yeah it's like you know uh, I think this, the the uh, the idea of like a learning um, from each other or thinking about this uh, this heavy issue differently through like humor or some lighthearted kind of you know game setting is very important. People don't excited about showing up the diversity training and listening lectures, right? But game is fun and it creates a space. And it's a pragmatic, so people can really um, learn without actually, you know, like uh, learning. 
Um, just to add to what Anya was saying, I think the idea of um, questions in the middle or at the end of the game that ask the users to think about what just happened is a good self-reflexive process that doesn't often happen and is not often asked of people. Yes, you ask them to do that kind of work in classrooms, but it's sort of like a, a regrouping that could happen at the end of games. Uh, one consideration is to also provide resources or even to work um, not necessarily um, a group therapy session afterwards, but to work uh, a, a mode of conversation as part of the gameplay that might help to alleviate along the way. But in that consideration, the discomfort, going back to what Kushan has already said, the discomfort really depends on who the audience, the intended audience is. If this game is a, is a game on racial equity for white people, that is a very different conversation um, in, in terms of how to practice anti-racism, the, the resources should be different and resources I think should be provided to um, eliminate the, uh, the, the possibility that, um, that um, racialized people have to be the ones to come in and educate. Instead, offer them the resources and ask them to teach themselves. That's a really big part of the work that if when people ask all the time, how what can they do to be better allies, that sort of thing, learn by yourself is number one um and th then like try to jump and then i'm um, using kishana's metaphor and then join us on this train uh providing resources i think would be a really good way to make it a little bit more um something more of a, of a growth experience uh using jen whitson's uh that part of her question and uh, resources definitely should be there as part of the end in, because I, I think leaving it, playing the game and asking them to just go off into their everyday lives is part of the problem. And too much of what uh, people often do, like they sort of, they do their their progressive work and then pat themselves on the back and said, I did it, I'm done. No, like do it and then think about what has happened, talk about it. That's the better mediating process and sort of digestion process of what has just happened. It almost needs to happen. Otherwise, there was no point. It was a performance. I have lots to say about performativity. <laughs> okay, so we have a uh, we have a number of other great questions that have come in. So the next one is: uh, We are planning to do an exploratory study on economic and social factors on the influence on games. How would you feel about a serious game where, where they are used to teach specific subjects through gamified exercises and simulations? Sure, I'll take it. Um, I'll take um, planning to do exploratory study on economic social factors and flows of games. Sorry, I'm, re I'm reading it again because I want to make sure that I um, use just how much you think. Um, the serious game genre is is very useful, right? So often whenever, like I often bring in, you know, these kinds of games, you know, the games for change, you know, kind of genre of games, like into the classroom to teach about like tough topics, right? Um, I think, you know, we also are bound by, you know, like the um, the mechanics of the space that we're operating in, right? You know, so whether that's, you know, from like, you know, a digital game or if it's like a board game, you know, there are certain things like that, that you have to do and you, so you have to gamify experiences, right? Um, and I think, you know, some people, you know, often think that this is like an insensitive thing. Like if you're gamifying like um, experiences, I'm thinking about, was it um, uh, Darfur? There was like a game, that, you know, about like Rwanda, you know, about the genocide of Rwanda, you know, there was like a, you know, there, there have been a lot of people like generating like these VR experiences where you're seeing a lot of like, you know, like Black Death in particular, and, you know, there are games that want to like generate like empathy. So, ga so games, you know, have like a long history of trying to you know, gamify, you know, different kinds of experiences to get people, you know, to to have empathy, to understand like the human condition, to understand, you know, like the, these atrocious things that have happened to like certain communities, right? Um, but I think that as long as you, you know, which is, I mean, um, I think you just have to recognize, you know, just like the limitations of what, you know, these these um, tools and technologies like can offer um, and just recognize that, you know, you um, your your game could also just to be to could replicate, you know, the same like oppressions and it could like be replicating um, like just playing somebody's pain. 
right? Um, I remember being like, uh, I was on an advisory board for these folks who were, it was in Baltimore and they were trying to, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and they were trying to like really like create a game that, you know, kind of took you through through the day of like a young black boy in, in the city and it ultimately ends in his death, right? So like you experience him dying, you know, and I'm like, no way, we're not going to do it. And then they, these folks were really like committed to saying, you know, like, this will help. I think, you know, if we're just immersed in his experience, then we'll see. I'm like, well, you tell me that, you know, and this this was like really like in the midst of like, you know, hashtag Black Lives Matter, you know, where there was a hashtag Black person, Black brown person dead, black, Indigenous person dead like every other, every other day, right? Um, and, and and right, right, absolutely. And I'm just sitting here thinking, I'm like, if that didn't do anything to change the hearts and minds of people, then why all of a sudden is your magical VR experience going to do it? It's not. It's not. You know, I'm just going to go ahead and get you to the end goal. Like, it's not. You know, you're just going to, you're a part of this genre now, you know, this pleasure porn where we're just seeing like pain and struggle of certain populations and, and at whose expense? I'm like, you know, you have to think like, who's audio, like, who are you really like, like trying to reach? So I'm like, y'all need to go back to the drawing board, do some focus groups again. Like, if you just, we just want to see it. I'm even thinking about, I'm going back to that, that the Good Morning America spot that I just did today. You know, really, I mean, shout out to Good Morning America, but but still, at the, the, the lead up to this was they didn't believe what black gamers were saying. You know, they weren't believing, you know, that, that people were, experiences were, all, were racist and sexist and just awful, right? So they set up like an experiment to say, well, we just want to see it like firsthand. And so we set up the, the experiment and lo and behold, of course, there's racism. And then we had to be subject to that just so that they, you know, Good Morning America could just believe, you know, what we were saying. And then when they aired the segment, they had to like bleep all everything out, you know, because it was so, so awful. They had to censor it. So people didn't even get to experience it. I'm like, so why subject us to that? If you weren't even going to show it, like, what's the point in that? So just, that's the point that I just want. Like, if you're going to do it, think about what utility is it serving, right? Do we actually have to see all this death and all this pain and all this struggle? Do we have to see rape? Do we have, do we ha actually have to see it for your point to get across? So you, that's a, that's a question that you have to engage it. What am I doing it for? Is it to be a provocateur? Are you to be, is it to be sensational? Is it to get hits and clicks and likes? Is it so people will buy it? Like the most provocative thing, like it's bought, like, well, this is just the, the era that we're in. And if that's what you're doing it for then you need to rethink it you need to go back to the drawing board you really probably need to like cut that part so you have to think does it have generative value or are you being extractive this is not a board game example but i was thinking about um playthroughs or not playthroughs but uh role-playing games in which uh people have to step into the shoes of someone there's there are all sorts of problems with that including the idea that um one can just step into the shoes and then therefore understand an entire history. And I don't think that that's accurate. I, I'm, I'm going to give an example. I'll just copy and paste it into the chat. This is not a game, but it is uh, what I consider to be a pretty responsible or uh, relatively successful example. It's a Try Guys video called the Try Guys Try Immigrating to America, in, in which they role play as various international characters with these complicated um personal and political backstories and they're each trying to move um immigrate to america and they each confront unique and realistic obstacles but it was excellent in that they avoided performativity and in, in doing so and avoided sensationalism and avoided um things that even in in a in a even if we were to see them in a movie we would consider to be a sort of like Michael Bay-esque cop out of just trying to create and evoke emotion, which doesn't actually have an end point. It just creates us if a feeling of of us knowing that it's wrong, and then nothing follows through. But in this video, they didn't perform what it means to be from um, Iran or from Mexico, and they didn't change. They didn't like. They were not asked to be like pretend what it. But uh, imagine what it's like to be a woman, or pretend to be poor and to have children. That sort of. Um, I, I, Kishana, did you describe it as being pornographic? Yeah, I, it actually reminds me of when I when um, when I see photography of um, people in in other countries, especially poor people. Like vacation photos of poor people are to me a kind of um, violence that is done upon that group uh, as from an outsider's perspective. I think it. I, I could also um, liken performativity to being. Uh, violent and uh, pornographic in that the photos are often can be considered in, in the realm of of exploitation porn or uh, it also reminds me of when people take photos of 
things that are are like in ruins and that's called ruin porn. Um, it's not that it's sexual. That's not what I mean by porn. I mean that it is uh, sensationalist and meant to create and, inc and incite a sort of uh, a climactic feeling that doesn't actually go anywhere. <laughs> Metaphors of sex. Anyway, it just adds, so in, in this sort of Try Guys video, it had asked them to imagine these scenarios in a respectful way. And um, this is going back to Joseph Tu's question. Thank you for your question. Um, how, how can we imagine these scenarios that are in a respectful and realistic way that don't hi make them hyperbolic and also that don't take up those people's spaces? If there are stories to tell, can we get those stories without making up those stories um, and also without means there are there's things like using statistics, but I see that later questions are about how to tell these stories without being explicitly anti racist. So almost like sneak in the medicine. And while people are thinking about games there, I have I, I don't know if this is something that people want me to address now or later, but I have a whole bunch of practical questions or suggestions in regards to design about what should not be done and okay. um, I'm sure. I mean, I mean, just based on Anur and and, and Kishona's uh, Kishona's uh, um, expression, it seems like we all have things about what should not be done. Maybe that could be a separate question, or or or. Uh, I can talk I, about I, it now. I, <laughs> I'm going to talk about it now. Yeah. Who wants to go? I have so many things to avoid. Well, I'm doing the I'm doing the the fail list now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would like to express my idea about serious game. Um, on the top of every everything you said, I think uh, sustainability of serious game is another thing that as a designer we have to keep in mind. Uh, many times commercial games have this much longer life and maintains, you know, like user feedbacks and like army of researcher. Uh, try to do like, you know, different ethnography user centered evaluation to how to make it better and like a more like a fun way that, you know, expand the market. So um, versus many serious game, educational games, um, you know, researcher or uh, uh, educator have some funding and then they design the games or like they just do it with uh, with their good heart. but for long-term sustainability, it's really hard to continue uh, without much of funding or institutional support or uh, infrastructure. So um, what are like what are the statistics about the life of those serious games and like how you know um, designers could ethically contribute to the longer, term maintains and uh, integrating different feedback at different phases, um, how can we, you know, support the collaboration and get a broader audience or um, better reception of those serious games? I think those those questions are um, very important to think about for designers. Thank you. Laichi, why don't you jump into your what to avoid list? I think we all want to hear that. I wrote a whole section on this. Okay. Sure. Not ask for people's stories. If they're out them, you can use them uh, with uh, with people's permission. Otherwise, uh, do not use people's stories um, with other consent. And in that sense, do not perform. Uh, There's somebody on Twitter who recently wrote her, their name is, oops, hang on, let me see. To everyone, Razor Femme on Twitter wrote, um, sometimes when people ask you to tell their story, what they're really saying is bleed for me. And in this sense, it can be traumatic to ask people for uh, testimonies and like, oh, how can I uh, like what 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 experiences have you had with confrontations with the police and how can I integrate that into my story? Why would you ask someone that you wouldn't ask like in what ways have people have been homophobic towards you? I'm like that's an inappropriate question unless I offer you. It's it's not your business and uh, don't ask. Uh, by POC, if your game is realistic enough, I think that is a very weird question. Um, don't ask them to play your game in order to verify the quality of your anti-racist message unless they want to. So nobody's obligated to play your game to verify that it gets the check marks and, and that it can be approved. And also that's only one person's opinion. A variety is what you're looking for. Um, don't design games that are meant to fix the world. Kishana kind of spoke to this earlier. 
But if your main objective is to promote an, uh, let's say, anti-racist act activism, then don't sidetrack that goal and don't like do yourself that just that you and your game that disjustice by sidetracking that goal by, for instance, bringing in major themes around uh, women's rights and child labor in addition to anti racism, because each of those topics, as I mentioned earlier, deserve their own conversations and lumping them all together. I, I think really risks watering all of them down. In fact, I, I mean, I find it even offensive to, to kind of try to have to tackle all of those issues of, of inequality together, because it's it's basically the content version of All Lives Matter. And um, finally, don't critique uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color's game design if it's not about race or racial politics. Um, race, racialized people are allowed to create and design things that just make them happy. They don't have to be about race. I can make a game about fashion if I want, and that's my prerogative, and it doesn't, I don't have to, like consider the issues of politics that would um would otherwise make me unhappy if I just want to make a game for myself or for others on another topic. So um racialized people are not representatives of their entire race. They don't owe game industries their racial politics just because of their identity. It's not we did not choose to be born in these sort of in, in these bodies and in these cultures and there and therefore we do not like go through the world needing to be representatives. Um, I think n not that, I mean, you know what, I'm just going to end it there. Those, that was my list. I can, I can like copy and paste some of those. <laughs> I think if you could copy and paste those, that would be really helpful. That was a great list. Um, Kishana and I know do, do either of you want to add to the things to avoid list? That is a concise, precise, straight on the straight to the point list. I just want to say I, it's amazing, and and I think that it's important that that's that's like folks is jumping off point and it, with creating. I'm not gonna add. I think we could end the whole event right there because that was just like amazing. Like yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you, Lychee. Yeah, that was powerful. Okay. Don't leave yet. We have a few. We have some more questions to answer. So. Um, the next one is that um, in the games shared, what are the gaming mechanisms that teach players the theme message? For example, a gaming mechanism could be an event system that presents opportunities for a player to bully others. As a result, the player gains short-term social popularity, but then another event can present to another player that he or she can report the bullying event and that results in the bullying player losing social popularity. But help me under what? What's the question? I heard the example was I, the example was last, but what? What was the question? I'm so sorry. So what are the mechanisms that uh, teach players the theme message? Um, I, I'm I'm not sure. I'm gonna have to. I gotta sit. See, wait. I'm gonna shut up because I don't. I don't have a response right yet. And maybe I don't get the question. Is there a different way that, that the, the that you could ask the question? Because I I don't I don't even think I know what's being asked. I'm so sorry. And I'm, I'm more of like a visual person, so I was trying to see where the question was. Also, that's just how my brain set up. So maybe I'll ask um, the participant who submitted the question if they could maybe reword or clarify what what they want to ask for the panelists. That would be much appreciated. Uh, and in the meantime, maybe we'll go to the next question. And so we'll give give that person a chance to uh, maybe clarify that. Um, so next question is, what can be done on the mechanical versus narrative level? A lot of the games mentioned have been very explicit in their message, but can you lean on the implicit message in mechanics? As an extreme example, can you make an anti-racist board game that is not immediately obvious as an anti-racist board game? <sighs> <laughs> uh, I appreciate your question. You know, this is like a whole genre in in media um, of like going around the the back door to come in to to where you're trying to do right. Um, think about like for instance, I'm I'm thinking about like games like you know that always have like the 
animal stand in to talk about blackness or they have the elves represent like the racial conversation or, you know, they, they, you know, they, they, they give us some kind of, or even like, you know, like the movie Avatar, you know, where we had like these, um, you know, these folks that were supposed to be like the stand in for like indigenous cultures and, you know, but, the, but it's, so I, I don't, I don't know what the, what the utility of this is, right? Is that part of maybe like the work then of making sure that those spaces are safe and comfortable, you know, so that privileged bodies can engage it without being threatened or without being triggered or without being like inflamed? Because for me, I think that that must be like what folks might be trying to do. And I just don't know why people don't just use the words that they want to use, do the things that they want to do and get to the point of what they're trying to do. Right. Because I guess for me, I mean, when we got folks like dying in the streets and dying and, you know, you know, we've got, you know, fo folks, you know, their their livelihoods are being destroyed and threatened because, you know, we've got, you know, privileged bodies that don't want to acknowledge their existence. You know, I, I just don't have time, you know, for a metaphor and an analogy. You know, I have to say, hey, like trans lives matter. This is how we can keep folks safe. Black lives matter. Hey, you know, indigenous, you know, populations, you know, need like, 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 we just need to say what we need to say. Um, because I, I, don't, I don't have time for games. I know it's here. It's the game panel. Right. But if we're trying to use games to say, do particular kinds of things, we ain't got time for some, you know, to, to placate people's feelings. Like some people's feelings are just going to get hurt. And I'm not worried about feelings, you know, when people are dying. I guess I'm just, I don't have like the time to do that. Now, granted, I know that there has been like some amazing, you know, I don't want to like, you know, you know, um, rain on the parade of anybody who's doing like a lot of this, you know, interesting work, you know, and they're like, hey, you know, we had these cute little animals and elves, but did you understand, you know, that's like a stand in, you know, but for being different and for trans people. Hey, is that cute? Is this okay for you? Is this okay? I, I just don't, I don't have time for that. Maybe I'm not the person to answer this question. I'm so sorry. Uh, so I'm going to defer right now, but I'm just like, if you want to, if you want to do anti-racist work, you need to do anti-racist work. You know, that, that's, we, we ain't got time for nothing else. Yeah, I think, you know, like um, anti-racism is also um, sort of like a inequality in a bigger sense, right? Um, you, anytime when you think of this is fair or this is unfair, that is something that gives you some insight about like, you know, what is fair, what is um, unfair. If you start off with very different position, if you have different educational background, or if you just treat it differently because you have different accent, how would you feel about it? So when you say, hey, this is unfair, I lost the game like because of this, because the structure of the game is not really well designed and it's in favor of this, that um, there creates this kind of like a discussion. For example, um, I played this game very long time ago about the, the democracy and basically all the card players have, uh, you know, if this is a democracy, you have certain issue to vote. And uh, uh, if you are minority who have different cards, um, the majority decide like, you know, the next gameplay. So without saying this is like you know equity game immediately if i lose i would think about you know like how um being minority in this game affects um my my next move so this kind of like a subtle way or metaphorical way also help players to think about it for example uh this weekend i played the game called high treason <laughs> Uh, and it's based on a true uh, historical uh, event about, you know, like from the Canadian history. So apparently it's a trial of Louisa Rail and it's a landmark, landmark case. And it's a two person uh, high skill strategy card game um, that, you know, like we battle for the influence and for the uh, sway jurors to like, you know, win, like one is prosecutor, one is defendant. And we played like five times and then always like, you know, prosecutors win. And uh, the other, we play differently, but we were so frustrated and we start reading about it, like why this is happening, you know, like why I'm keep losing and then realize that because you know there are so much history behind it and based on the if it's like english speaking or uh, french speaking catholic jurors like this case happened so many times and every time uh, when they have different jurors when they have different results so uh this kind of you know like bring uh important 
issue like leads us to read about this case for like an hour, right? So that will also uh, create this kind of like, you know, if you bring this um, this curiosity or uh, this mechanism, like, oh, why I will keep losing with this positionality, I'm going to read more, I'm going to do my research. That also, I think, um, good mechanics to create, you know, like the continuity of the discussion. If I can just um, using Kistrana's example earlier, I I was really struck by um, a pedagogical approach that you I think that you were saying that you'd taken, in which you started out with something like monopoly, which was familiar and can be considered um, not boring, but it's just not something that people actively try to play. But uh, the message that came out of it was that this is that that life is not fair unless you are extremely rich and i think that's a, just a general rule of thumb and that seems to be an easy like a sort of gradual way into the conversation which ultimately does need to be about anti-racism but if it if it if you don't want to go full steam ahead then starting everyone on the same um that doesn't work but starting people out with the same mindset that there are problems that we'd like to address might be a stepping stone into mm -hmm. a conversation that ultimately needs to happen but um, yeah, why not start with something like Monopoly? Ooh, or why not make a Monopoly that then goes dark, where <laughs> uh, like like a like a rever like a reversion of Mono um, a new version of Monopoly? Yeah, yeah, that that that's great. Like I remember one of my student team actually uh, uh, made a game that you know like this whole world. Uh, same sex marriage is the norm and the heterosex marriage is a sin. And then you have to find a way to convince a different party or get recognition. And, and it's like sort of like imagining the alternative narrative, right? And it start off, it gives you um, uh, lots of to, to think about. Okay. I like that idea of dark monopoly. Someone needs to get on that. <laughs> and design it. Um, so uh, our last audience question is, how intentional do you think the ignoring of equity is in the game publishing industry? And how do we effectively name it? So I don't think that there's like malintent, like, you know, on, on the part of like, you know, publishing folks and people like gatekeepers, the people in charge of these things, right? You know, I don't, you know, they're not like sitting around at the table, you know, like we grew up with like, you know, it's the man did it. We got to take down the man, you know, it's not like, you know, I mean, or, or maybe, maybe I'm naive, but, you know, I just feel like, you know, for most of these folks, you know, they have, they have good intentions, um, but it's just not a part of like their, their, their lexicon to talk about these things and think about these things um, because they are in a privileged position, right? You know, so we have, this is why we have to like urge them to like re think about things. I'm even, you know, I had a conversation in the literary field about, you know, like children's literature is like so white and so so much of the common literature, you know, you know, is like very white communication. So white, Oscar, so white, everything's so white. Right. And then we have to like, you know, always, always like, you know, insert ourselves um, in these conversations, you know, because we get forgotten. We're like an afterthought. Right. And then that's why, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's, um, and then the problem comes in if like people continue to resist, you know, if people say like, oh, there's not a market for this. We can't sell this. You're not profitable. Women aren't profitable. You know, we can't, nobody really wants to see this. Or if they do want to see it, then, you know, also from like, you know, like media studies, you know, there's like, like the, like the big three, like for feature like black folks and all populations have, you know, like what's going to be like acceptable, right? Right. So like for, for, for Asian women, you know, they want the, like the geisha, you know, for, you know, black people, they want the criminal element, you know, for, for brown women, you know, they got to be the help, always the maid, always like the, the domestic, right? You know, for Native American folks, you know, you got to always be the chief. You know, so and when trying to get them to like move outside of that, that's the chore. And I think that's where like the real work is. So so they can recognize that our contributions are valid and our, our stories are meaningful and our stories should be a part of like their lexicon, you know, but because, you know, we're othered you know, and we're marginalized, like just in their mindset, you know, we have to like do this work. And then a lot of people 
you know, just like assume that that means that we don't value, you know, like what's there. We're just like, we just want to be a part of those conversations too. You know, so I, so I, I give, I'm probably a bit more generous than I need to be for a lot of these entities. You know, I give them a space to correct their behavior, right? I give them a chance and say, Hey, this is where you've gone wrong. These are the errors. This is how like you can fix your errors. But if they continue to do it, then they're either, they're very racist and they're, or they're just willfully ignorant, you know, and either one, and you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm less, you know, I'm, I'm less generous, you know, like around that. So I give folks like, you know, like the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, you know, maybe most people don't know. Um, and, and so I think that that's, that's why, you know, I think that it's important that people just like be ready for the, for, to, to make mistakes and to hear from us when you've made those mistakes. And if you make those mistakes and you, and, and as, as Kishana just said, if you continue them, then that's where the actual fault comes in. It reminds me a lot of, um, this is not a board game, but, uh, so I think in both board games and in and in the industry, it's it's um, too easy to say, oh, well, the industry can't do anything now once the game is out. I'm like, no, not necessarily, especially if it's digital. You can't you can't fix a bug. If you can fix a bug, you can fix a larger stru pro design problem in your game. Mm -hmm. And um, a really strong example for me uh, in relation to conversations that I actually in relation to our first question. Uh, in um in regards to being open to changing parts of your game i mentioned and, and also where our where our backgrounds are from from a lot of my research on, on in computational bias deals with issues of um geographic information systems in relation to urban planning and gentrification so for me and as a as a as an object text or a kind of case study pokemon go was such a huge fail in terms of racial bias um it was the result of designers and industrial designers not considering how something something like geography impacts game players and who's not allowed to enter certain spaces um and how that how no, who's not allowed to enter certain spaces would impact game players is something that should have been alleviated and fixed so uh here's here's a link as well on um on on poker walking while while black uh, it's dangerous, for instance, to put, let's say, a very rare Pokemon in a white suburban neighborhood and just ask people to go in and collect their Pokemon. And I remember that there were a lot of issues around this that made the game what was supposed to be a worldwide phenomenon and made it actually unsafe for some people. Again, uh, I, well, I don't think that that was intentional whatsoever, but the, the that game actually works as a as an international and um interesting case study and so many levels including uh questions of accessibility worldwide and and to do with national politics so i think that in korea it, the game wasn't available but it was available in japan so a lot of people in south korea took a bus all the way to the south of, J of south korea until they were almost near this one Japanese island and they could access and download the game. So it's a, um, so like the internet, well, the intended access didn't end up being as they designed, but once they realized that they should have fixed it instead of like just letting it go on. Uh -huh. Um, so I know you've all kind of spoken to this and like throughout this panel, but if you could explicitly speak to what's at stake if we don't start taking innovative approaches to anti-racism education. Say that again. I'm so sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Like you. No, 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 we can repeat the question. What's at stake if we don't start taking innovative approaches to anti-racism education? Um, so it's not like, I think really what, what's at stake, you know, really impacts the people who are mo most hurt by this stuff, right? Like marginalized folks, um, you know, but for for the privileged among us, like you don't 
there's nothing at stake for you, right? You know, I would just hope that we could activate more allies within the space and more comrades or accomplices or whatever the name, you know, progressive folks are using these days, you know, to, to describe themselves. Um, I, I, would, I would like to think that people who are in positions of power would want to do this work because they realize that we have limited access to, to, to resources and to opportunities and to platforms to be able to, to you know, like express, you know, a, a lot of the things that that we want to express, right? You know, for, you know. So I'm thinking about, for instance, why there's a reason why we see so many, like, you know, Black and Indigenous people, like, using like Twitter. You know, we don't have access to anything else, right? You know, we, so we have Twitter. We've got we've got a a, pla a social media platform, you know, where we can say and do whatever we want. You know, so you know, that's why you know people hate like cancel and call out culture, right? Well, what else do you expect us to do? Nobody's being held accountable, you know. So I guess I would I just wish that more people would like recognize like the power that they have with their platform and with the tools that they have at their disposal and with the games that they make and the, the books that they write and the other things that they create. And, you know, we'll just, you know, try to be on board with a lot of these conversations, right? You know, like the people, you know, it, it shouldn't just be, you know, like, you know, Black, Indigenous, like Latinx, Asian folks, you know, shouting like, yes, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, right? Because none of us really have like access to like a lot of the institutional power, right? And we have different approximations like to whiteness, but, you know, it would be great to see, you know, the people who actually c can do something like to shift these conversations and have access access to, to, you know, to, to, you know, access to like people in uh, positions of power to defund the police and to, you know, abolish ICE and to do these things that we need to be done, you know, uh, because I really like what, what's at stake is just continue the continued, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide and you know death of of the people that matter to us right you know like um, we're just trying to figure out like a different way to get these stories out there so people can recognize our humanity right i mean that's what we're still fighting for you know i just i just and and um so i mean if that matters to to you all and you know you you say hey well i can't do much but i can make a game do all that you can in that game to make sure that you, you know, you get these messages out and then you help people really like, you know, think around the, these kinds of games. I think that would be a beautiful game right there. You know, so people can understand like the difference between like reform the police and defund the police. Like cause some people are very confused on that. You know, that could be something like really powerful so people can see there is no reforming, right? They got to go. It's got to go. It's got to go. You know, so that, that's a game example. I'd love to see that actually. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. The racism is a structural um, phenomena and many people, you know, like, oh, I'm not racist or uh, do we have racism? This kind of like debate, you know, it's yes, this this world have structural racism in every society, in Asian society. Like when I tell folks that I uh, research racism in China context and then they just like, you know, oh, my God, there is racism in China, you know, so. The, the beginning is like you acknowledge there is a problem and then as a community bottom up, you understand um, and you come together to change it to better society, to better future for next generation. You know, like we think we, we like to think we came a long way. We like to think we are pro we are progressive liberal people like, you know, on, on the, but still like people make basic mistakes um and it, just despite the fact that race doesn't have a real biological definition uh people you know like make lots of honest mistakes like uh if there there are some like i have uh quite a few indigenous activist friends who are very white looking and they have this kind of like a reverse racism when they say that they are indigenous people are skeptical or like you know give some heartful comments so you know from bottom up we have to understand this this is not biological this is not colored this is like you know like a challenging your your like formulated um opinion and how could you create some inclusive society and like like Roshana said for humanity you know like we all still believe in humanities i think um that deserve a good work to you know like uh, fight for um so the, the original question what's at stake i find to be a very 101 question no offense to whoever wrote the question it's just a sort of it's it's the uh let's return to the beginning question it's it's uh it's like asking what's at stake if we don't 
tackle climate crisis. It's not really worth discussing, but the conversation like where we, we can go with this is in um, regards to anti racism education. Maybe one thing that we can do is uh, one problem with education in general is it's so much, especially university education or college education in the States, it's so much um, it, and, and inclusive or what we used to call an ivory tower. I guess some people still call that in that sense, thinking about education as it pertains to wider communities is something that we can do. So not just education for those who can access it, but education for all. And I know that games are one particular approach towards that kind of work. Um, which is important. We can think about alternative modes of education. And uh, if people can, feel as if they can't really do very much, at the very least, they have access to others and access, is, access to more community-based uh, resources. This is also, I mean, if people want to use very researchy language, what we often in Canada refer to as knowledge mobilization, thinking about knowledge as it pertains to others who are not just scholars. So mm -hmm. scholarly and academic and non academic audiences. That's ultimately the goal here. It's not for us all to preach to the converted. If we're all here, see everyone that's here and I assume and all the attendees already agree or they wouldn't be here to some degree. So mm -hmm. who can who can we talk to who doesn't agree to, with us and where do, how, where does education play in regards to that? Um, that's the actual that's the difficult work. Thank you. So, so as we kind of move towards a conclusion, I would just ask, are there any final thoughts you want to share? Anything that we haven't covered today that, that you would like people to leave with? I really, I hope people like go away, like not feel like defeated. Cause I know we said like a lot of tough things, you know, and, you know, we had like tough conversations, but, you know, hopefully, you know, if you're, if you're sitting like in discomfort, you know, or experiencing discomfort, excuse me, you know, um, I, I think, you know, you have to think about, you know, why, like, is it because, you know, feel like you feel like the, the task is too daunting, um, or you feel like you're not equipped, you know, for the task, like you want to do this work, but you don't know how, um, you know, and I think that's where, like, most of the growth, that's where your growth is going to happen, you know, um, and I, and I don't want you to be, you know, discouraged from doing this work, but I hope that inspires you and motivates you to say, hey, you know, there are some areas where I need to grow, you know, it's not weakness, you know, it's, it's like, okay, there's like my area for growth, you know, I have some strengths, you know, but what do I need to like supplement my strengths with, you know, so, so that I'm I'm doing, you know, like the best work that I possibly can. Um, and I think, you know, just don't be afraid of like messing up. Like I mess up like all the time, you know, I'm still learning this stuff. You know, we, we all have like a journey to like, you know, you know, reach you know, these, these points of like, you know, what, what we've learned, but I'm open to like learning and, and doing better, you know? Um, and, and if, if you just do that, then you, you can have comfort in knowing that the product that you put out, you know, is, is the, is that best, the best that you could do like in that moment, but know that the work j just doesn't stop there, right? Knowing that you're going to continue to build and get better and to grow um, and to be really like responsive to like, you know, the challenges that, you know, like we're facing right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Uh, my best advice to designers is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Like, like you said, don't ask a biopic community to like, hey, can you play my game and tell me what worked, what didn't work? Just invite them at the very beginning. Can you be a co-designer? It doesn't matter if that person is not designer or never had experience in game designing before. They can still offer a lot. Give the same power as you and respect them and then deep listen to them and um, make decisions together. Uh, we are so used to in this kind of like especially designers and in industry uh this power of like uh, making creative decisions and uh creating something that what we want and control the quality so when it's out of control that you know like uh you have to like change or significantly modify your design people get very upset so can you challenge that that process itself will teach you a lot. So having like a uh, four person in the in the in the team, all of you are designer. It's not like one is leader, others are follower or uh, testers, right? Like, can you create that kind of mechanism and make that uh, game work? 
especially in this unsettling time of COVID-19, we are more isolated and we are in this, you know, um, in our bubble. And also uh, for other folks, like, you know, um, be generous about your, you know, expertise. Uh, don't afraid of share your experience and own it. You know, like, don't let others use your story, but work with them to tell your story and like make your voice heard. So I think uh, there's many different uh, procedures to collaborate effectively. Um, in that case, you will have better result than it. It takes time. It's a it's a don it's a long process. Collaborative work consume much longer time than doing something by yourself. So keep this in mind and just come up with a strategy to navigate this kind of challenge. That's my biggest advice. My takeaway, I guess, from this is uh, just a uh, feeling of gratitude to be able to have this conversation with Ainur and Kishana today. Um, Gratitude to those who have attended and those who've organized this. I've, I'm, I'm glad that this conversation was able to happen, even though I did mention it, uh, describe it as being um, as preaching to the converted. I still think it's a conversation that needs to happen and hopefully can help to foster uh, a showcase that we can at least be proud of and that can start to facilitate some conversations in this sense as a message. Um, yes, we have said some. Um, stark things. If you're tired from listening, I promise you we're tired from talking. If I have 100 energy and emotion dollars, I spent 60 of them in the last two in two hours. Um, if I spent if I have $100 for today, I spent 60 just now. Um, and in that sense, uh, at the same time, I'm I think that was money well spent in that uh, we. I wanted this conversation to happen, but I also want those who are uh, interested in in continuing um, participating in the showcase or even thinking about this topic a little bit more just to confirm that you can do it. Um, I believe in you and um, that if you truly think that you have something to add something that's responsibly done, then do it. Uh, we're we're rooting for you. We want it to be done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, I think that was just such a great wrap up comment and, and all the final comments and you know on behalf of the organizers and the panelists thank you so much the collective wisdom of this panel is is really impressive and you know i know it takes a lot of energy and emotional labor to keep talking about these issues so we are certainly grateful that you made the time today um to to really unpack these things in such detail and nuance and i think it's going to set set that up folks for a really um, productive showcase. So thank you for that. Um, so I just, I on, you know, wrapping up, I just wanna provide some details about the next steps with the showcase. Um, so as, as I mentioned, there will be a uh, web page, and I think the link was shared earlier in the chat area. So you can, can refer back to that web page for more information. So November 10th, there'll be details about the design, resources, submission, and the showcase posted on that, that web page. Uh, this is the detailed launch of the design event. And so it will go out to the entire University of Waterloo community, which will give today's attendees lots of opportunities to form collaborative teams. Uh, February 15 uh, will be the submissions as per the instructions that will be outlined at the November 10th launch. Uh, and approximately around April 15 is when we will have the virtual showcase. So again, these details will be on the website. Um, just wanted to share them now. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our attendees for, for making the time and really excited to see what this brings. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Sean and Ainur.